Ever since the launch of the M1 Mac back in November 2020, there's been this small group of people basically scrambling to get Linux running on it. Now, I don't really care about owning the device myself. I've had Apple devices in the past. They're good devices, but they're way too locked down for any of the stuff that I want to do. But I understand why it is a technically impressive device. And I can fully understand why owners of the device would want to be able to run Linux on it. And coming soon, you may actually be able to do so. As soon as June, M1 Mac support will be coming to Linux. But before we talk about that, let's see how we actually got here because it's actually an interesting journey. While there are always gonna be Mac users who want to run Linux, that wasn't gonna really kickstart a project. Really what kickstarted the project is when this statement was made by Linus Torvalds, where Linus Torvalds said he would like to use an M1 Mac if it could actually run Linux. At the time, just after the launch of the device, this was thought to basically be impossible because of how locked down the device is. But he wanted the device because it would greatly simplify the process of doing Linux for ARM development because what it would do is give him access to desktop class performance with an ARM-based CPU because while there are ARM-based laptops that do exist and there are actually ARM-based laptops that actually ship with Linux, the problem is they're not really powerful machines. The M1 Mac though competes with i7s and this is more than adequate because the way that you typically do ARM-based development for something like a kernel is you do it in the cloud because that's really the only way to get enough ARM performance to reasonably compile a kernel. Ultimately, he would want to wait until there is a Mac Pro that ships with an M1, which probably won't be the same M1. It would be like a M1 Extreme or whatever they end up calling it, where you could get really, really high performance from it. Now, the first step that was made that might not sound impressive was made in December. So this allowed you to actually virtualize Linux and Windows inside of an M1 Mac. What makes this impressive is the architecture. So typically when you virtualize something, let's say you're running an Arch Linux system and you want to have a Ubuntu VM on it. So both of these operating systems are x86 operating systems. So any of the CPU calls being made by the Ubuntu VM can actually be read by your normal CPU. But when you want to virtualize, say, x86 Linux on an ARM-based CPU, you've actually got a problem here because the x86 calls can't be understood by the ARM CPU. So you don't just have to virtualize the operating system, you also have to emulate its CPU architecture. And normally this comes with a massive performance hit. So one example of this is, let's say you wanna go and run a PS3 emulator. So there is no world that you can say that a modern desktop computer is slower than a PS3, but if you just go and try to use your middle of the road desktop to emulate a PS3 game, it is barely going to work. We are only just getting to the point with the absolute top end hardware where we can actually run PS3 games really well through an emulator. And that's because the architecture is so different. So what makes this impressive is the fact that you can get basically native performance. And if you want to go see a good example of this, some ordinary gamers actually went and played things like Yakuza on an M1 Mac. And for most macOS users who just dabble in Windows and Linux, this is probably going to be fine. If you want to just say run Windows for a random assignment because you need some Windows specific software, this will work as well as you could want it to do. But obviously, this isn't where we stop. Moving on to January, this is where we got another really cool announcement. So a group called Corellium was actually working on porting Ubuntu to actually run natively on the M1 Mac. So not virtualizing it, actually having it so it runs natively on the hardware, which I think is a really, really impressive feat. Now, this isn't perfect. It's not like you can just go and take your Ubuntu ISO, stick it on a USB drive, plug it into the M1 Mac, and then just magically install it. It does require you to go and swap in a custom kernel to the ISO. So if you don't know how to do that, it's going to be a bit difficult. There is a tutorial on their blog where they actually made this on how to actually do it. So if you want to go and read through what they actually had to change, some of the challenges they went through, I would recommend going and reading through this. But if you just want the tutorial, you can come down to the bottom here. 
but it isn't perfect still. You still need a USB-C dongle to actually do networking because the networking hardware is very, very locked down, but that's fine. You can at least still run Ubuntu on it. The problem with this though is that because you're running a custom kernel, it may not 100% work. If you try to install updates, they might break a bit and it's just not gonna be a perfect setup. Also, this is just on Ubuntu. So while you could get the custom kernel working on other distros, it's still not going to be a super portable solution. So obviously we don't stop here. Now around the same time that Corellium was making their custom kernel, someone else was getting involved as well. This person is a man known as Hector Martin and he didn't just want to make a custom kernel for the M1 Max, that's boring. What he wanted to do was bring native Linux support to the M1 Max. Now, this isn't just some random person with no experience asking for money to do this. He is a very, very experienced and established hardware hacker with his previous project being getting the PS4 to actually run Linux, which he successfully did. And you can run Vulkan on it and you can run Dolphin on it and play Nintendo games. It is really, really impressive. Now, presumably he is an Apple user himself and this just seemed like a good new challenge. So one thing he actually did, which is really cool, is he decided that with the Patreon, he wasn't going to accept any payments until it hit $4,000 of contributions a month because that was the point where he decided that he could actually spend a reasonable amount of time on the project and actually get it done at some point. In the few months since then, he also went and made a new distro project known as Asahi Linux, and this is basically where all of this development is going to be done. Now, all of the articles about this has its fair share of naysayers saying things like, this is impossible, this won't work unless Apple actually decides to help you, which is obviously never going to happen. Why would anyone want to do this? Just go buy a different computer where you can actually run Linux on it. And you know what? All of those arguments are completely fair, but... Why shouldn't this be done? If someone wants to get Linux running on an M1 Mac, that's a cool project. Why shouldn't someone do that? And if people want to fund it, they can fund it if they want. Now, unlike the Ubuntu port by Corellium, I think this is going to be far less, I guess, visually impressive, but from a technical perspective, I think is considerably more important. So Hector Martin and Asahi Linux have been very, very hard at work, and they're not just working hard on the distro. So Asahi Linux has an upstream first development philosophy, basically meaning that most of the work they do is going to be done trying to improve the upstream code, and then that upstream code can be made use of in their project. What this basically means is rather than having a custom kernel, they're actually going to get M1 Max support natively in the Linux kernel. So a pull request has been made to actually add this in. The pull request has been accepted and it's likely going to be in the code base in kernel 5.13. Now we don't know exactly when that's gonna be coming out, but it's probably going to be sometime around June. So the pull request in question is this one right here. And if you wanna go and look at the code that was changed, you can go and do so. I'm not gonna go through that in this video, but I will give you a brief overview of the functionality that has been added. Effectively what we're getting are the absolute basic drivers to get a functioning Linux system. So what we're getting is UART support, interrupts for the Apple interrupt controller, SMP support, a simple FB based frame buffer, and a device tree for the Mac mini, which should work on the other M1 devices as well. Effectively, what this means is if you install Linux on this, you'll be able to open up your TTY and use that. That's basically it. You're not gonna be able to do things like run GNOME anytime soon or anything like that but it's a good first step. Along with this, what they did is when and made a new bootloader that can actually handle this new M1 hardware known as M1 M1. And you can actually go and look at the code on GitHub for that. And if you wanna go and contribute to it, you can go and do so here. Now, throughout all of this development on M1 hardware, there's been some discoveries made. So while running Linux on your smartphone is fairly easy because the ARM hardware in that device is fairly standard. 
unsurprisingly, the M1 Mac is full of proprietary software and proprietary architectures and doesn't at all work like an ARM system would on your phone. Can anyone honestly tell me that they're not surprised that Apple would go and do this? So Tom's Hardware has a really good write-up about the architecture discoveries made about the M1 Mac while Corellium was actually making their custom kernel. So let's skip ahead to where those discoveries are. So one of those discoveries is the way the M1 Mac actually finds the kernel. So typically an ARM-based system will use an interface known as PSCI, Power State Coordination Interface, but the M1 Mac, however, uses a predefined register address to start up the kernel instead. Also, rather than having a standard ARM interrupt controller, Apple went and designed their own proprietary solution, which is not at all compliant with the standard. Also for Apple's Wi-Fi and Bluetooth controllers, it connects the SoC through a non-standard PCIe based protocol rather than just doing things the way everyone else does. Also for its USB controller, it uses the company's proprietary input and output memory management unit called the device art resolution table, which obviously will need new drivers to actually support it. And that's just a small selection of the new problems. As for the old problems, we still have to deal with things like hardware acceleration. So full driver support is a very long way away. I have no idea how long it's going to take. I would predict at least a year, but it's probably going to be much longer than that. So I don't expect just random people who own M1 Macs to be running Linux on day to day on it. But even so, it's still better than nothing. A first step is still a first step. And if you are interested in hacking around with the M1 Mac, this is a really cool change to see. I have no interest in running it myself, but I still think it's pretty cool. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. Before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim, Donald, Michael, Andrew, Nathan, David, Will, Brennan, Chica Bento, Jamie Joseph, Mitchell Pitty, Stephen Turner, Tushar, and all of my $2 supporters. If you'd like to go support the work, there will be links down below to my Patreon, subscribe, start, leave a pay, and all that sort of stuff. If you want to go and support us here Linux, there will also be a link to that one down below as well. If you want to go watch my podcast, that is Tech Over Tea, available basically anywhere. And if you want to go watch my content on a platform that isn't YouTube, you can go watch it on Odyssey and BitChute. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. Let me know in the comment section down below if you care at all about this or if this is just some random project that is going to just leave your memory as soon as you stop watching the video. I think that's everything for me and I'm out.